Bergeron Briefs. My name is Art Bergeron. Uh, I'm an elder law attorney at Myrick O'Connell. For those of you who haven't seen the show before, Myrick O'Connell is a firm that has 60 lawyers in it. I do nothing but elder law. The other 59 do something else. Uh, I've done presentations here um, in Whalen talking about elder issues, and the purpose of this show is to really supplement those presentations, to supplement the seminars that I do, uh, to help you understand as a senior or as a person who's working with somebody who's a senior, what the big issues are that you need to know and who the people are that you need to know. And one of those people is my friend Tammy Pazuricki. Thank you very much, Tammy, for coming to the show. Thank you for having me. So, so tell me briefly, Tammy, and tell the folks that here, so that the other folks understand and watching, what can uh, watching can understand. So what do you do exactly? And how did you come to be doing it? And then we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. Um, well, I right now I'm going into my eighth year and of owning Pleasant Trees Adult Day and Consulting Services. Mm -hmm. What is that? Pleasant Trees is a home-based social model day program mm -hmm. specialized in earlier to mid stages of Alzheimer's and dementia care. Mm -hmm. So what I do is provide. I was say, and what is that? What right. Is a, what is a day program? What is so that mean? what I do is provide the individual for a reason to get up in the morning, a purpose um, to enjoy socialization. As we know, with Alzheimer's and dementia, it can be very isolating to someone and the caregiver with the disease. Mm -hmm. So they come to my program uh, five days a week. It's Monday through Friday. And they can come more than or more than or a few days or all week or whatever. Right. They yeah. can come two, three, four, yeah. or five days, um, yeah. up to eight hours a day. I have folks that come for nine and a half hours a day. The, the, the biggest deal is to be flexible to the needs of the caregiver. And before we continue talking about that, so tell me, so how did you start doing this? How did so you come I, to be doing this? I graduated with a, I have a master's in counseling psychology yeah. and led my way to working as a social worker in long-term care. Mm -hmm. And I worked with folks with dementia and their families for 17 years. And my grandmother actually developed the disease. So along the way, I found that in the beginning of the disease process was mm -hmm. the most challenging for my grandparents and my family um, because two of the most vibrant people going out every weekend, dancing, and uh, it just stopped. And, and just we saw depression. And there, they weren't, she was not ready for something that's already in existence called an adult day health medical model. Yeah, and I suppose what's interesting about that is that it's, folks who are in that situation aren't the folks you would have seen when you were in long-term care. Exactly. You would have seen people in a very different situation. So to actually have it happening with somebody in your own family, you kind of see it. Absolutely. Right? And, and I and, and so from from can you talk a little bit about that? Can you talk about from your own perspective? What was that like? What happened? You know, with your grandmother and your grandfather? What was some of the what was some of the issues? Because I bet there are a lot like the issues that are faced by people that you're now seeing who are, might be interested in the day program. It's really difficult to watch it happen in your own family. Yeah. Um, professionally, I've sort of built a wall. I get emotionally attached, but it's not the same as having it in your own family. And what we saw in the beginning is just simple forgetfulness and misplacing of things. And um, a lot of times, uh, my, one would ask my grandmother a question and yeah. she'd just do the look to my grandfather and he'd answer for her. So he was right. covering for her. Um, Which you must see a lot. We do, because yeah. they're, you know, folks who've been married that long and together, one knows what the other one needs for an answer. Right. So you're not right. going to see it at the forefront. Um, and, but and, and how were your, how many children did your grandparents have? Three. And how, how did they deal with that as, as things, as this was started? A lot of it was on my mom's shoulders, because she was the local child. Uh, the yep. other two were in different states. The designated daughter. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Um, and it was it because I was a social worker in healthcare, dealing with other folks with it. I was the go-to person, but it was right. difficult because I was the go-to person as a granddaughter and as a social worker. So. Right. So your mother was kind of using you as a backup. 
And there right. were things that my grandfather and grandmother stopped doing because of the disease process. And I found yeah. that to be very sad. And it was time for them to start developing their own social networks. And one way they can do that is to engage in an earlier stage program where that person with the disease is able to develop new network of friends that are supportive and yeah. alike in that fashion. And then for my grandfather to develop friends on the outside of the disease to be able to do things he wanted to do. And, and can you talk about Talk about that a little bit. Once again, it's related to your own to your own grandparents. This issue of once the disease hits, maybe some of your old friends having some real difficulty maintaining their relationships with you just because of their reactions to the disease itself also. It happens in families and it happens in friends. Um, it's a very, it, it, it's actually lessening uh, with the stigma of mm -hmm. the disease. I see it more and more because of the, the um, level of education that's out there now for it. But people don't know how to deal with it when they're that close to the disease. Um, and you know, it shuts people down. It, it, they don't call as much. When right. the person with the disease forgets your name, forgets your face, they don't, you know, as a friend or family, you don't know how to deal with it. So the best thing for you to do as a, a coping mechanism is to pull back. Right. So it's, right. it's sad to see, because I see it a lot with the families I deal with. But it's hard if you're the friend that way, just because you don't know what to say. As, as you know, my, my mother went through this, I saw the same thing with my mother going first and my father. Or my father kind of covering for my mother, being nervous about it, getting angry, all of these things. So with that as background, so now talk a little bit more about the, 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 the social day program. So you've been doing this now for quite a few years. Um, so what, in, in, in a day, what happens? You don't have anybody that stays with you overnight, right? So people no. are kind of showing up for the, for the day. How are they getting there? So family provides yeah. the transportation. Yeah. Because it's such a small home-based program, there's no funding for the transportation. But family, we work that out. Family does it, or they hire a private caregiver, or they have friends. But eventually, they're dropped off in the morning, and we do all our own home cooking, and they have a breakfast yeah. together at the table. Um, then we're engaging them in all sorts of facilitated activity. Oh, but, and excuse me for interrupting you, but by the way, so I'm, I'm a vis visual agency in this place because I've been there, and, and, but folks wouldn't necessarily realize how many people are there there? If, during a typical day when you've got folks who are, who are coming in, and are caretakers, are caregivers there also, people who were dropping people off, or, or is it just the folks who've got the early stage dementia? So it's just the, the person with the disease process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's about eight to ten who come, you know, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And I have two staff there on, on all the time. Sometimes three if my census gets up into, you know, maximum is about 12. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's just like they're visiting their daughter's home for the day. Because you're located in a formal In a home. residential, it's a single family, yes. It's a single family house. Right, so it does. They, it's non-institutional. They're not going to a large facility-based program. Um, so we're looking for the individual to find a purpose during the day. So, you know, I have a woman that arrives at 7 a.m. every morning, and she yeah. gets her gloves on, and she helps make the salad every day. I have a woman that comes in and perpetually loves to help with housekeeping tasks and laundry right. folding and the the gentlemen I've had them help me paint the garden beds and you know it's 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 not all paint about the garden beds. So we have deck gardens and they're oh. wooden. Oh. Oh. So every year they need to be refreshed with paint and they they yeah. get involved with that or yeah. we interact a lot with nature. We're outside as much as we can. Um, gardening and uh, grooming and things like that that get them involved with things that they would be doing at home. Mm -hmm. um, when I say facilitated activity, we want them to feel successful. It's not just about playing bingo. It's not just about playing a game. It's about what's going to make them feel like they're, that they have a purpose, you know? Um, so if someone is interested in art, in painting, I have folks who haven't picked up a paintbrush since they were in kindergarten, and yeah. they create amazing, successful pieces of art that they're proud of. Um, now, from, from the way you're describing this, <coughs> excuse me, I would imagine that your 
knowledge of this or your sense of the way in which to, to, to really look at a person and find those things that could really engage them has probably really evolved over time, right? I would think that your program itself is, must have changed over time. It has and it changes every day and it, it's changing based upon the needs of the guests. Um, and what their abilities are. We focus on what they can do and not what they can no longer do. Right. Um, and the socialization piece just happens. They get up from the lunch table and I look over and I see two gentlemen on the couch chit-chatting, um, reminiscing. And um, we do music engagement programs and pet therapy. They love children. And we're engaging them constantly yeah. and it is a proven way to slow down the disease progression is by socialization and engagement activity. And so you, and you're, but you're talking about the fact that everybody who is there has, is, is in some stage of dementia, of memory loss. And, and by the way, are most of these folks, do they have dementia as a result of Alzheimer's or do, they have, are you, do you have folks there whose dementia comes from other diseases? I have a very uh, wide variety yeah. of folks who are dealing with different dementia disease processes. Um, Alzheimer's is the most frequent that we see, yeah. and I can have folks as young as 60. Um, and then we see vascular dementia and frontal temporal lobe dementia. and. Um, you know, the, the different, and it, it, they are different. They're very different processes, but um, it's all about the individual. And, 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 and do you find, because this relates to, I know, a conversation we've had before about how important it is for folks who have ha are having some memory loss or early, what may be early dementia issues to get a diagnosis so that you really understand what's causing this. But if, are you, do you find that for folks with, different, with dementia coming from different diseases, it plays out differently and the, the, the way that you're interacting with them is would be different? Absolutely, because, um, well first it's very important to get a diagnosis. Yeah. And in mo a lot of cases, I get folks in my program before they've even got a diagnosis. And the thing is that they're treated very differently and the progression is different. So I have a woman who's been with me over five years with mm -hmm. frontotemporal lobe dementia. Mm -hmm. Now if she had had Alzheimer's, it's going to take a very different track. Right. Um, right. You know, I have men and women, and one may have Alzheimer's, and the other may have Alzheimer's, but they're progressing differently because one's a man, one's a woman. I see. So I, see. I could have someone with me for six months to a year, or past three years. Um, it really depends upon when they enter the program, where they're at in the disease process. And I just want to step back now to something else you said. So you talked about you were getting off the, from the table, and you just noticed a couple folks just kind of the, having a conversation. Now both of those folks have got dementia, right? Does that happen a lot? That you that you really I shouldn't say that that happened a lot. Can you describe how different that is than having folks who have dementia talking with some somebody else, with talking with a stranger or whatever? A lot of times people who aren't familiar with the disease process don't have the patience nor the tolerance of someone repeating themselves or telling the same story or word finding difficulty and not being able to get out what they want to say. When you have folks who are dealing with that disease, they don't care how many times it takes to get across a thought or come up with a word. And that's why we're there they too. Get they get they it. Get it. And, and it's a forgiving environment, an accepting environment. What I've seen is like the, the typical person who's been attending a senior center, choosing their activities, and then no longer able to initiate, make friends, choose an activity, yeah. and they're found floundering in the senior center. But when they come to a program like Pleasant Trees, we facilitate it for them so that they feel successful, like, I can do this, I can actually have a conversation without fearing judgment. Right, so. right, that's a very different experience. So, the, one of the reasons why I invited you on the show was uh, I had called a, a, a friend of mine who, who, they work at Jewish Family Services, Jewish Family and Children's Services in Waltham, if I recall correctly, her name is Salzburg. Beth, yes. Beth Salzburg. Is it Salzburg or Stoltzberg? Stoltzberg. Stolzberg. She's going to kill me now because I said that on TV. So Beth Stolzberg, because I, because I said I wanted to do a show about memory cafes, and I know that they did one. And she said, oh, I can't make it. I'd really like to make it to this show. 
but you should really call Tammy Pazuricki. I said, well, Tammy Pazuricki, she lives in my hometown in Marlboro, <laughs> right? And that's where, the, that's where her, but, but I didn't know, that, that, and I knew she was at a memory cafe, right? She said, oh, well, that was the first one. That was the first one in the state. Yes. So you're never, you know, you never cease to amaze me. So tell me about what that is, what a memory cafe is, why you started doing it, how it has, has evolved, how it is different from your program stuff. Sure. So I was coming across some reading news articles um, yeah. on social media and found out what was called the Alzheimer's Cafe. I read a lot about it. It began in Europe, mm -hmm. and this uh, Dr. Lukvig, she started a memory cafe in uh, New Mexico, and mm -hmm. I thought, wow, this is really interesting. Well, what is it? A cafe is a supportive um, environment that's provided for the caregiver and their loved one with a dementia disease process to go at the, at the same time. That's right. So they all arrive. It's a, probably a two hour span. They socialize. They engage with each other. There mm -hmm. may be some facilitated activity. I was very interested in it. It's free. It's open to anybody in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I went and attended one in Dover, New Hampshire, and that was the closest one. So about six years ago, I created mine, and it's called Create a Better Day Cafe. Um, and it's on the fourth Sunday of each month from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. Now, there were plenty of months starting this up that I was just sitting there by myself waiting for people waiting for to arrive. To and now it averages about 20 people each Aww. month. It's amazing because people are so lonely with this disease. The caregivers, the individuals, and this gets them out. And they can be at any level of the disease process. It doesn't yeah. have to be early stage. As long as the caregiver is with them. Mm -hmm. um, and they and, and that's, part of the, that's part of the program, the, yes. the format here, is that the caregiver is with the person. Yes, right? yes. And do they tend, and, and from your experience, to folks, so what happens during the two hours? Do folks, do the caregivers tend to congregate kind of in one corner in the kind of the folks that they're caring for in another corner, and, and what happens? Each cafe is different. Is that, you know, sometimes I'm I sure will... every month is different. It, every right? month is different. And right. of course, it depends on the weather. It depends on how people are feeling. I, most cafes, you don't RSVP. You wake up in that morning and you say, let's go for a ride. Let's go somewhere. Um, they arrive, and of course, we have refreshments. Yeah. They sign in. They get a name badge introduced to other people. Sometimes we'll have facilitated activity, like I have uh, pet therapy yep. that comes almost every month. We'll have music therapy. You have pet therapy that comes. So that, is, yeah. that, is that the neighbor's dog? What do you mean by it's, pet therapy? I work through Therapy Dogs International, and I have oh. two very good friends in Northboro who have two Burmese mo mountain dogs, oh, Kodiak Burmese and Athena, yeah. and they come for a visit, and they are just so wonderful to have there. Um, I'll give you an example. One one Sunday, the Patriots were playing last winter, yeah. and my husband made chili, and we all sat down and rooted the Patriots on and, and had chili it. and, watched and socialized. So it's a it's a great way to have folks feel normal, and that's the idea behind pleasantries, behind the cafe. It's all about feeling normal and not outcasted because you have Alzheimer's. Because you have the disease. Mm. And, and now, as I mentioned, Beth said yours was the first one. Are there many other memory cafes around? Now? Yes, I, I, I am amazed at how yeah. this has taken off. Beth started what's called a ca uh, memory cafe percolator meeting, which she has pulled in professionals and organizations that are looking to start these cafes. We're really trying to build um, guidelines on, yep. and, and Dr. Lukvig has essentially brought this to us, the United States, and she has set guidelines. And, you know, it's not a marketing tool. It's not, y you don't charge people to attend. This is our way to give back mm -hmm. to the community. Um, and everyone who goes to these percolator meetings, they're just jazzed about it. Right. Everybody's is different. What's nice is that she's organized it in such a way that people don't try to overlap same day, same time. Right. So right. an individual and their loved one can go to a, a lot of different cafes. Because that's one of the things that really interested me when I, when I heard about this, was I was saying to myself, this, this notion, wouldn't it be great 
you know, if you are in, if you're living in one of the communities around here, and there are five or six of these, so you just have this ability on any given week, often on different days, to just kind of stop in. Absolutely. Just to stop in and just, and, and you're really providing yourself with a variety of people, you're bumping into different people, because there may be some people that it kind of doesn't quite fit. Yeah one particular group, but there may be another group that really fits. So it just sounds very exciting. And Dr. Lukvig's been great as far as keeping a website, um, alzheimerscafe.com, I yeah. think it's .com, um, that actually posts all the cafes in every state. So oh, that's somewhat, great. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, thank you very much for You're explaining welcome. that. Thanks for talking to us about how the, the supportive day program works and you know I'm, I'm we're, I think we're all hoping there'll be more of those and the notion of if you want to stay at home knowing that you can kind of get out absolutely not necessarily every day but a lot of days and go to somebody's memory cafe is like just really cool yeah so um, you have a sense of Tammy Pazaricki you have a sense of that supportive day program I know there are others in this area but but you, you know you, the, you, now you have a sense of how they work and of this recently developing and I think really burgeoning memory cafe movement. This may be relevant to you, to someone you know. I hope that you'll share this information and I look forward to seeing you on the, uh, the next installment of Bridgeron Briefs. Thank you very much. Thank you.